let us continue our discussion on the Australian method and here we are going to focus our attention on the material and specifically I am going to focus my attention on unbound granular materials and asphalt bitumen. So, in fact, when people call this as asphalt, they are talking in terms of bituminous mixtures. Okay. Uh, modified granular material, cemented material, they have their own intricacies associated with that in terms of checking for fatigue and all those things. These are details that you can, if you are interested, you can read it on your own from the guideline. And in fact, I have also shown you how to download the guideline. So, let us uh, uh, continue with our uh, discussion here. So, what are the various categories that they say? In fact, unbound granular material, modified granular material, cemented material and bituminous material. Now, these are all the kind of material types they define. So, you can talk in terms of crushed rock, gravel, soil aggregate, granular, stabilized material. Now, the stabilized material could be with the cement, lime, anything, but there is a separate category called the bitumen stabilized material what the South African code TG2, when you are using wrap, they will call it as bitumen stabilized material. It could be chemically modified material, cement, lime, fly ash or slag modified material. And similarly, for the cemented material, it could be lime, cement, fly ash, etc. And so, this is what is asphalt. Now, what are the basic parameters that you are going to do for the design purpose? You need modulus, you need Poisson's ratio and most importantly, what the Australian code will do which is not done in any other design code is what is really called as the degree of anisotropy. Okay. So, I hope you all know what is isotropy, what is anisotropy. Basically, something to do with the direction dependent material response. So, if I take any chunk of the material, I apply a load in this direction and then I go to the, uh, take the, uh, another chunk from the same material and I apply a load in the other direction, whether these responses will be same or not. So, you are talking in terms of isotropy or anisotropy, right. So, here you are talking in terms of modulus, Poisson's ratio, degree of anisotropy, as far as the cement material is concerned, they do not really worry too much about the isotropy part. So, they use it the modulus and Poisson's ratio and uh, for bituminous material it is modulus and Poisson's ratio. Now, what are all the performance criteria? I have uh, given very clearly for bituminous material only fatigue relationship is used. For uh, unbound granular material, we will basically use the permanent deformation. I will show you some details about what exactly is one should do as far as the permanent deformation is concerned, right. For the unbound granular material, what is the modulus value that you should basically use? This is called as, though they call it as resilient modulus, I mean E, the actual definition is the SHRP strategic highway research program based research that resulted in the resilient modulus and this is the resilient modulus equation that you use. So, K1, K2, K3 are the material parameters and this is what is really called as octahedral shear stress and this is the reference stress and this is the mean normal stress. Okay. So, in fact, uh, the interesting genesis about all these materials is what that would have been already covered is the so called k theta models. <coughs> so, that means, if you take a granular material subjected to different sets of a deviator as well as confinement condition and try to measure the 
resilient properties or what I would really call as shakedown response, you can define a modulus called resilient modulus. This resilient modulus is a function of your confinement pressure and in fact, the theta that is used in uh, the old uh, models basically talks in, in terms of the same thing that is given here as sigma m. <coughs> okay. So, these are little more sophisticated models. The fact that you have an octahedral shear stress is here tells you that you have considered the influence of shear here. In the earlier models, the influence of shear was not taken into account. So, what it means is, so if you now take a look at uh, uh, these values, the range of the modulus can go from 200 to 500, 150 to uh, 400 MPa and this is the typical vertical modulus. Okay. And uh, how is the, uh, uh, then the degree of anisotropy is given here by this particular number 2. So, basically the I anisotropy is anisotropy values are defined in terms of the ratios of the vertical modulus to the so called horizontal modulus. So, that is how these things are defined here. So, the degree of anisotropy is something like 2. So, that means the range of Poisson's ratio is given here and similarly typical values of Poisson's ratio is also given here. Okay. So, you are going to have one modulus in the vertical direction, another modulus in the horizontal direction and these are defined in terms of the degree of anisotropy. Okay. So, I hope it is very clear. Now, the next thing that you do is, this is something similar that we have done in IRC 37 as far as the granular materials are concerned. What is really called as the equivalent modulus on the influence of thickness of overlain material. So, the equivalent modulus and the influence of thickness of overlain material and this is something that we have discussed in the uh, IRC 37 design code also, but here it is done in a slightly different way. So, for different overlain materials, okay, so you see H1, it could be H2 or H, H3 and this is what you see here is the total thickness. So, if you know the individual layer, so let us say H1, H2, E1 and E2, then you can actually use this to compute what is really called as the equivalent modulus. Okay. So, this equivalent modulus will be used by uh, you in the design calculation. Okay. Right. Now, we discussed that the Australians are very specific about one thing the granular material response will be quantified characterized in terms of their permanent deformation and for bituminous mixtures they very clearly say that you need to take care of the fatigue. Now, how is the granular material permanent deformation taken into account? By running extensive cycles of repeated load test. So, in fact, what you really do is you can actually see here the deviatoric stress is 350, here it is 450 here it is 550 and you do this test in the drained condition. So, do it at uh, 70 percent of the OMC and 100 percent of uh, uh, the density basically. That is what we try to do it here and then you are going to see, uh, see that the loads are applied extensively for 30,000 cycles and in fact, let us say you are talking about fine grained sub base kind of a material that you use not the base course material, sub base material. Uh, if you follow ASHTO T307, you are going to apply something like 500 preloading cycles plus 1500 cycles only. The 1500 cycles are split into 500 cycles each, uh, 1 to 5, 6 to 10 and 11 to 15. So, from, from 1 to 5, you keep one confinement condition and then you vary the deviatoric and 6 to 10 you reduce the confinement and vary the deviatoric and 11 to 15 again you reduce the confinement and vary the deviatoric condition. What exactly the idea behind that kind of a test is to try and see whether you can 
compute the so called resilient modulus or the resilient elastic state, resilient strain. Now, the main problem here is the sample should reach what is really called as the shakedown limit. So, that means if I tried to see, so let us say you call this as the total strain and this is the number of cycles. So, think of your soil sample like this. So, you subject it to confinement conditions. In addition, you apply a deviatory clothing. So, and then you apply what is really called as the Haversine compression. Keep on doing it. So, what can happen? So, the total strain can actually reach one optimal state after which you can see that, uh, so this is the total, this is going to be your so called plastic strain and this portion is what is really called as the resilient strain. So, you need to reach that correct state, but how do we know how many cycles we need to run it, so that we can actually reach this state, we do not know. Okay. So, what we now do is we run it for something like 10,000 cycles, 10,000 cycles and 10,000 cycles. Now, you might be asking, so do we really need to run these many cycles to reach the resilient strain? You do not have to. If you are using a reasonably good granular material, you do not need to really use uh, that much. Within 100 cycles, you will reach your shakedown limit. But sometimes you may have to reach run with 10,000 cycles and that is what the Australian code also tells you. So, basically what they do is they want you to find out the modulus by running this kind of cycles. They also want you to uh, limit the permanent deformation at the end of these cycles. In my opinion, this is probably one of the very first code, probably other than one uh, portion in the European code that it tells you how to limit the granular material. And I just want to share some interesting work that we did with uh, at IIT Madras similar to this because what we did was we were asked to see whether we could use this uh, pond ash as a possible subgrade material. So, you know fly ash, bottom ash, pond ash and all those things, right. So, we want to use pond ash. Now, pond ash cannot straight away be used in the uh, pavement layer. So, we have to you do it with uh, 2 percent, 3 percent or uh, some portion of the cement needed to be added. So, what we did was we wanted to see whether we could run a test similar to that and that is what we did. So, we ran 10,000 cycles, 20,000 cycles, 30,000 cycles at different confinement conditions and for various deviatory load. And you can actually see this is all for uh, uh, unmodified pond ash as it is used. The L stands for light compaction, H stands for heavy compaction and we did it with plus OIMC, minus OIMC and at OIMC as can be seen when you did it with heavy compaction at minus 2 percent, you can see that it reached the shakedown whereas, when you used at OIMC light compaction plus 2 percent, it never reached the shakedown limit. So, this means if you ever use this material in your pavement as a subgrade, this material is going to permanently keep on deforming, it is not good for your pavement. And how did we come to this conclusion? By just running 30,000 cycles in the laboratory. Okay. Now, look at the interesting things. So, we did this with the 0, L, H and all those things. This is, now we did with the 2 percent and 3 percent cement. So, you can say, okay, so let us use cement. Now, the next question that you want to ask is, as a practicing engineer, how much cement should we use? So, I say, okay, we will use 2 percent and 3 percent. Then you can actually see here how the uh, values keeps vary. Okay, so, this is the whole idea behind this kind of a test. So, this is a 
work that was published by it is part of a PhD thesis of one of our student and it was published in a few journals. Okay. So, you can get in touch with me if you are interested in those kind of things. Now, let us come to asphalt. So, this is as far as the granular material is concerned. So, let us understand there are unbound granular materials, there are bound granular materials. Okay. We talked only about the unbound granular material and here there are some ranges of modulus values are given and for each of this model uh, granular materials we are expected to find out the resilient modulus and for finding out the resilient mod and this is to be used if as far as the design purpose is concerned. So, there are three parameters k1, k2, k3 you need to determine right. So, that is done. Then after that you want to check how these materials will fail in the field when, it, when you are talking in terms of the permanent deformation. So, Australian code tells you to run 10,000 cycles, 10,000 cycles, 10,000 cycles at a different deviatory condition and then they fix a, a limit for the permanent deformation and if your material passes that you can use this. So, let us understand this very carefully. There is a modulus value that is given here. Okay. The modulus value that you see here is given and this formula tells you how to estimate the modulus value. This is for design purpose and then if you have equivalent layer thickness, how to find out the equivalent modulus for design purpose. Those things are given here. What now this tells you is how to use this information for permanent deformation of granular material as far as the distress is concerned. So, those things are given here. Okay. So, I hope this is very clear now. Now, let us go to asphalt. So, uh, the first thing is when they use the word asphalt, they are talking in terms of bituminous mixtures. So, there should not be any confusion because I am just going to repeat the word asphalt because that is what is mentioned in their design guideline. But whenever I use the word asphalt, you need to understand that I am talking about the mixture, not the binder. So, this is the nominal maximum aggregate size and this is the compacted layer thickness. And in fact, you can actually see that between the maximum size, nominal maximum maximum size and the compacted th uh, layer thickness, you are looking at around 2 to 2 and a half to 4 that is the uh, layer thickness that you are looking at. In fact, the interesting point that I want to make here and which is something that I also mentioned earlier in uh, many of the lectures we have had is there is a trial design here. So, unlike any other infrastructure or any sophisticated structural uh, analysis that you do for multi-storied building in which you have some flexibility related to the thickness of the frames, shells and so on and so forth. Here you do not have because your thickness of your bituminous layer is already decided by the gradation that you are going to use. So, if your gradation is going to start with a nominal maximum aggregate size of let us say 19 mm, they have written it as 20 mm. So, let us talk in terms of 19, 13.2, 9.5. 6.3, 4.75 and so on and so forth. So, if you are talking in terms of that 19 mm, then your layer thickness is going to be somewhere between 50 to 80 mm. And there is also a constructability class because if you are going to have a layer thickness of let us say 100 mm, it is going to be extremely difficult for a hot mix asphalt manufacturer to lay that thickness and get the required density. So, there are also those issues. So, your design now has to hover somewhere between these thicknesses. Okay. This is a wide range of thickness in which you can play around, but please understand that this is how it should. And in fact, if I rewrite IRC 37 and uh, why I am uh, saying this, there are MORTH guidelines that, that, that tells you the uh, relation between the aggregate size as well as the lift thickness. But that information also should be integrated here because this is a design guideline and in the same way in which I was telling IRC 3 should become part of this. Only then the whole thing will be available in one single crux, right. Then comes to the next thing, okay. So, this is again very important. This is not something that is emphasized very clearly in most of the design guidelines including our own. IRC 37. What exactly is the thing? So, if you are familiar with the bituminous mix design, you will know that uh, the mix is laid and compacted somewhere in the aroids of 6 to 8 percent. 
over a period of time, let us say 4 or 5 years, this aeroids reduces, the mix becomes stiffer and let us say reaches a terminal aeroids of 4 percent. Now, when you are going to do the design, uh, what modulus value you should uh, measure? You will be thinking, what is it you are asking? The modulus value of the mixture as is laid? No, because since the mix is getting densified, its modulus value should increase. So, you do not want to do it at 2 or 3 percent, okay, because that is the terminal stage. You do not want to do it at 6 or 8 percent, because it is the starting stage. What you really want to do it to somewhere do it at uh, median value. So, these people would like us to do it at 5 percent, whereas uh, uh, Americans would ask you to do it at 4 percent. So, now you can actually see the uh, ratios here. So, if you are talking in terms of 7 to 8 percent, so let us talk this one. This is 7 percent and the modulus is going to be something of the order of 0.88 times the modulus that you are going to measure at 5 percent. Okay, so, this is the pivot point, Americans will do it somewhere here. Okay. So, what you may have to think in mind is when you design the payment and when you determine the material property, you should search in IRC 37. Are you saying anything about the aeroids that I should have when I want to measure the modulus? Uh, I do not know, you may want to go and take a look at it and check it and then email me saying that, yeah, I found it out and it is there and it is 4 percent or 5 percent. Okay. So, good luck to you on that. So, if you do those things, so then you will know clearly which is the portion that you need to really understand. The next thing that you need to do as far as the bituminous mixtures or asphalt is concerned is what is the temperature. Now, what did you do for uh, uh, in IRC? You used AAPT, average payment temperature, annual average payment temperature. What do these people <coughs> do? They want to do what is really called as weighted mean annual payment temperature W M A P T. This is weighted mean a annual air temperature and so this is the weighted weighing factor that is used. So, if you know the air temperature of any location, you can compute the weighing factor, substitute it here in this equation to get the weighted mean annual air temperature and then use this equation to find out what is the weighted mean annual payment temperature. Now, this is something that they have developed for the full of Australia. Okay. So, now I am just showing you only two tables here. If you go check it out on your own, there are three or four pages of each and every town, what is the WMAPT that they want you to use. See, for instance, you know, they say uh, there is some place called Adelaide, it is 27, there is border town 24, Sedona 26, like that they write. So, it will be nice, you know, if we write, uh, have an annexure in IRC in which we list all the major towns. If we start from, let us say, uh, Amritsar, Agartala, like that you go all the way down. Chennai, Mumbai, not only big cities, each and every small town, what is the pavement temperature. Now, how this will help you? So, let us say you are designing a pavement structure, the road goes through that particular town, you would like to really ask the question. Okay, so, I have this 100 kilometer road stretch and I have weather data corresponding to four locations and the temperature ranges are around, let us say, um, if you still want to use the average pavement temperature, please remember this is Australia, the average temperatures are slightly different compared to what we really talk in terms of India. So, let us not worry there that much. So, if you are able to say that okay, somewhere between 20 to 30 degree centigrade is what it is, then you will say for this 100 kilometer stretch, the minimum is 20, maximum is 30. So, what I would do, maybe I will design for rutting at 30 degree centigrade, maybe I will design for fatigue at 20 degree centigrade. So, when you make that statement, you now are talking in terms of solid footing because you know that this is the pavement temperature that you are really looking at. Okay. So, you need some kind of a data here like this. Now, uh, if you have taken your our mechanical characterization of bituminous material course, 
you would have noticed that we have spent lot of time discussing about master curve. Okay. So, I would not get into the details, but what I really want to show you here is let us assume 0 degree, 10 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree data I have collected for a range of frequencies that you see here. In fact, this is nothing but reduced frequency, you do not, you will not be able to test the material at this very high frequency. Normally, you will be able to test it for mixtures from 0.01 to 25 hertz, that itself is maximum. So, why I, this is important to you. So, uh, the frequency comes in terms of the loading rate, loading rate comes in terms of the mean speed of your heavy truck that you have in your mind, right. So, let us say you are talking in terms of uh, India. So, you will say, yeah, I know, I think 40 kilometer per hour is a decent speed for our truck. So, we need to convert it into some kind of a frequency. So, let us say we convert it, I am just making a guess here, let us say it comes to 40 hertz and then you say this is going to be 20 degree centigrade is going to be my weighted mean uh, temperature. So, now I have this data that I have collected at 0, 10, 20 and 30 at uh, let us say uh, 0 0.1, 1, uh, 10, 20 and 25 hertz. Okay. So, for a moment I will make it slightly complicated, I will say it is 12 hertz. So, now you will come and ask me, look 12 hertz is the loading rate for the truck that I see in the field and you have data only from 0 0.1 to 25, but not at 12 should I go and run a test at 12? No, that is not needed. So, what you could do is to measure it at standard frequencies and use a very important principle called time temperature superposition principle and then construct what is really called as a, this is your master curve. So, some data is shifted to the left, some data is shifted to the right, get your master curve and from this master curve for any given temperature and for any given frequencies, you can find out what exactly is the modulus value. In fact, what you really need to do, knowing the reference temperature, knowing the actual temperature, you can find out the shift factor, use the shift factor and uh, use it on the frequency that you want, you will get the reduced frequency and from that frequency, <coughs> you will be able to find out the modulus. So, that is the the idea behind uh, these things. So, how do we really find out this asphalt uh, design modulus? There are many methods that are given here. The first method is run a flexural modulus test, okay. Direct measurement of the flexural modulus test obtained from four point bending test. Again, I have to keep referring to, to our one of our earlier uh, NPTEL course mechanical characterization of bituminous material and you are going to see that uh, we have discussed in detail what is the four point bending test. So, you can conduct it at the in service temperature and for the rate of loading in the road bed. So, that means you take a beam, okay. so this is the end restraints and then this is four point bending. So, so this is subjected to a sinusoidal loading these two back ends. So, you are talking in terms of having pure bending here. Okay. So, this is what it entails. So, you do it. So, if somebody says I want it at 20 degree centigrade at 10 hertz frequency, just go run the test. And there are issues related to using the appropriate strain for computing something called as a flexural modulus, because what you are going to do, you are going to use a linear elastic theory to compute the flexural modulus. Of course, this material is not elastic in nature, but that is a different story for different time. The next is, uh, you do not need to uh, do the test for that specific temperature and frequency, rather you run uh, test at a different temperature and frequency combinations and then interpolate it using the master curve. Okay. So, that is what you are going to do, interpolation of the flexural modulus in the road bed from a range of four point bending test that span 
that uh, our weighted mean uh, uh, annual payment temperature and the rate of loading in the road bed condition and use the master curve. That is the second way. The third way is very simple. Uh, look, uh, this uh, doing this four point bending, collecting data, uh, constructing the master curve, reading from the master curve is way too complicated for me. I do not want to do all those things. Can you suggest me a simple test procedure that I can do? And you guys work out the calculations in the laboratory and you just tell me what is the number that I need to multiply to do that. Australia says no problem, go and do a standard indirect tensile test. And in fact, if you ask me, it is lot more complicated to run a standard indirect tensile test rather than running a 4 point uh, bending test because I could do the 4 point bending test very easily. Interpretation is also very easy whereas, when I am trying to do the standard indirect tensile test, it is going to be fairly complicated. Now, why it is complicated? Go read ASTM D7369 and send me a mail. I will tell you what are all the problems that we have. So, you can do the correlations like this and in the Australian code that you see, those details are also given. Another and the final way in which you can do is and this is age old uh, shell nomograph in which uh, um, what do you call is this is what is really called as the van der Poel nomograph. So, knowing the stiffness of bitumen and the volumetric properties of the aggregates, there is a um, uh, approximate way of finding out the stiffness of the material. That is what we are going to do there. So, that will be the values. So, four methods. First method is to measure the modulus depending on the temperature and the frequency that you want. Second, you already have collected lot of data, construct a master curve pull out the modulus for the frequency and temperature. Third is do a repeated load indirect tensile test and then relate the modulus using an empirical expression. Fourth, no experiments, all you really need to do is and in fact, you will be surprised if you go read the Van der Poel nomograph, all you really need is the mix design that gives you the volumetric properties and penetration and softening point of bitumen, that is all you will get the penetration index and from the penetration index you can compute what is the stiffness of the bitumen. Knowing the stiffness of the bitumen and knowing the volumetric properties, you can find out what is the uh, values, right. And then they also very clearly say use a Poisson's ratio of 0.4. Now, what is the Poisson's ratio that we assume for uh, bituminous mixtures in IRC 37? You can find it out by yourself. Now, depending on the different types of binders that are used, class 170, class uh, uh, 320, class 600. So, these are something like your VG30, VG40 you can think of. They also have what is really called as a multi-grade bitumen. We will not talk about all those things. So, this A10E is more like an polymer modified bitumen. So, depending on the maximum size of the power range, these values are given here. Now, what I really like here, here is the particle size bitumen grade 1, grade 2 is what you have, but if you go see our table in IRC 37, you are not going to see a big difference, but actually there is a big difference Dep depending on grade 1 or grade 2, which varies because of the nominal maximum aggregate size, the modulus values also will change. So, it varies from 3000 to 7000. So, this is what is the modulus value that you are going to get here. Okay. So, then we have already discussed this, I am just showing it because I want to emphasize this particular point. So, the fatigue of bituminous mixtures is if the binder content increases, the fatigue life will increase, but the flexural stiffness will decrease. If the binder viscosity, what will really happen? If the binder viscosity increases, the fatigue life will decrease, the flexural stiffness will increase. Compaction level, if it increases, the fatigue life will increase and the flexural stiffness also will increase. If the grading becomes coarse to fine, if that grading changes, 
then the fatigue life will change, but the flexural stiffness will decrease. And obviously, when the temperature increases, the effect on fatigue life will be given here. Okay. Now, I have mentioned about what is the connection between temperature and fatigue life here. You may want to recollect the discussion. This is an uh, expression that we have already given here. So, there is a shift factor, there is a project reliability factor. So, these things are given here. This shift factor is laboratory to field and mixture specific factors are taken into account. This is the modulus value, this is the strain, this is the volume of the bituminous binder. Okay. And finally, we come to the design part. Okay. What is that you come to uh, the you see here? Now, you see really interesting things. First, let us take a look at the critical locations. So, these are the critical locations that they want you to measure. 1, 2, 3, tensile strain at the bottom of asphalt, tensile strain at the bottom of cemented material, compressive strain at the top of subgrade. <coughs> now, the tensile strain at the bottom of the asphalt is used for your fatigue related calculations. Compressive strain at the top of subgrade is used for uh, permanent deformation, but permanent deformation of the granular materials are also checked separately. So, you are talking in terms of 800 kilo Pascal, which is considerably high compared to what we see in IRC 37. What is the uh, stress level to which you subjected to in IRC 37? By this time, you should be able to recollect. So, this is axle with a single tyre, axle with dual tyre. So, you have dual tyre 750 kilo Pascal, circular road radius is given here. So, you should be able to do all the calculations here. Now, I will, this is the uh, very last slide that we are really going to talk about as far as the Australian payment method is there, then we go to the ASHTO in the next lecture, USA. Now, what is the design protocol to be followed? Step 1, what you see here is select a trial payment and a project reliability. The references are given here, you can read it, you can download it and you can read it. Number 2. Determine the elastic properties of the in situ subgrade, selected subgrade and limest based subgrade. You need to have two modulus value, E v is the vertical modulus, vertical E h is 0.5 times E v. Okay. So, this is anisotropic model is used and Poisson's ratio of uh, is also basically that is given here. This is the formula that is given. Okay. Now, determine the elastic parameter as above of the top sublayer of the granular material if relevant, similarly for the sublayer, similarly for all the other granular material, find out the elastic parameter. Step 5 is elastic parameter for cemented material, elastic parameters for bituminous material, find out the adopted uh, subgrade strain criterion, find out determine the fatigue criteria. For cemented material, if you use, find, it, find out the fatigue criteria for asphalt, select the cumulative number of heavy vehicle axle group we have discussed and the traffic load distribution that comprises the design traffic. Now, check the uh, structural capacity of your pavement with the HVAGs and similarly, ESA is used by you for permanent deformation. HVAGs are used for fatigue. So, we have discussed all this in the earlier. So, I will stop here. We will continue our discussion on the American code in the next lecture and the final lecture will be some sample ideas about the design project. Thank you so much.